how are you mobilizing your party with the perpetual ban of of, of rallies in the country it is very difficult of course uh, <clears throat> it is very difficult um uh, uh because you, w when you go and mobilize whatever you say next thing you find a call out you're being harassed by uh, uh the police uh for silly reasons uh, but uh, this is a passing phase, Peter. It's a passing phase. We had a time uh, not so long ago, some of us were old enough, when, uh, you know, the mere mention of trying to challenge the president was treason. Just by you saying, uh, I want to be the next president of Zambia, that was treason. That is where we're coming from, the days of Kaunda. So what we are experiencing now, of course it is uh, bad for democracy and uh, um, we've moved from bad to waste but uh, it is not something that is insurmountable it is something that we're going to overcome and uh, it doesn't matter how well um, uh, president Hakainde Ichirema believes that uh, he's got this whole equation figured out how well he, he believes he's got um, uh, everything plotted in terms of how he will ensure that he remains the warm ayaya of Zambia. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is that even other presidents who were there before thought they had a perfect plan. They thought that they're going to be the warm ayaya of Zambia. Others wanted to go for a third term. Others wanted to do all sorts of things. You understand? But what happened? They failed. So my advice to President Hakainde Ichirema is that Hi lovely viewers, it's me again, your one and only Mtatim Pundu. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time on my channel, kindly subscribe to my YouTube channel by hitting the red subscribe button down below and turn the bell icon to join the notification squad. Don't forget to like, share and leave a comment. Tell me what you think about this video in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you lovely viewers. About the cost of living, really. And uh, when you look at our cost of living, uh, uh, even for basic essentials, you realize that it has significantly gone up uh, without a commensurate increase in the incomes of the population. When you look at uh, employment, uh, a lot of people are out of employment. When you look at businesses, uh, people are complaining about lack of liquidity the restructuring of uh, uh, of uh, of debt that's as far as the euro bonds are concerned mm -hmm. and also uh, the announcements of uh, the equity partner that uh, we finally have in Mopani Vedanta recapitalizing uh, KCM is there is the future any brighter than uh, is the future bright for Zambia now that we have investors in these places and our debt restructuring deal somewhat is going the direction where we want it to be going, which is getting agreement stage by stage. Mm. Peter, the issue of debt restructuring would have made sense for Zambia if the government was not borrowing any additional loans. But as we are speaking, we are talking about restructuring the old debt, but government is contracting huge amounts of additional debt. By so doing, we are not going anywhere in terms of debt sustainability as a nation. You understand? Mm. Because debt restructuring is simply saying that, okay, fine, we have been unable to repay our previous debt based on the payment terms that were agreed. So we want to revise those uh, payment PF borrowed in 10 years. So we are not going anywhere as a nation. That debt, uh, debt restructuring thing is not taking us anywhere. The only way it would have taken us anywhere is if government had put a moratorium, they had stopped additional contractional debt, or they had significantly reduced the rate at which we are borrowing. Then we can say, okay, we are moving towards a path of debt sustainability, a path whereby as a nation, we are not going to find ourselves in a situation whereby we don't have the resources to repay the debts that we are acquiring as a nation. Okay, I, I want to throw something at you. Can, can we run the way Zambia is? Are we able to run our economy without debt or run our budget it without is, debt? It is, it is, it is. How can we do that? Peter, I'm sure you've seen a number of our alternative national budgets. Mm -hmm. In our alternative national budgets, we have clearly outlined uh, how w resources can be generated and the expenditure can be sustained without having to borrow. So in all our alternative national budgets, we are trying clearly how that is done. But I'll give you a small example. When you look at our current budget, national budget at the moment, you find that uh, more than 50% is recurrent expenditure. What I mean by recurrent expenditure is that it is expenditure which is needed 
to sustain uh, salaries and so on and so forth. It is not developmental expenditure. It is not expenditure which you need to build a school or build a bridge or build an office block, no. You understand? So there are two types of expenditure, recurrent and developmental expenditure. So more than 50% of our expenditure is recurrent expenditure. And out of that recurrent expenditure, more than 90% more than 90 percent is actually salaries okay now when you look at the civil service you realize that um, uh, the majority of civil servants are predominantly uh, police officers uh, 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 teachers and medical personnel it is a given that uh, some sectors like health and education yes we need more personnel there but uh, when you talk about police officers we are recruiting an average of 750 officers every year from rely about 750 from um uh, uh convince mobile unit we are recruiting another about 750 from kafue you understand that is a total of about 2250 officers per year that is a lot of officers when you go to a police station let's say you go to woodlands police right now you go to the inquiries there you find more than 20 officers looming around roaming around the inquiries there doing nothing in particular and when you do a roll call you realize that you, woodlands police for instance would have an allocation a deployment of say 200 officers but the people who are present are less than 100. the question is where are the other ones they are absconding they just come uh, to work two minutes they go back so there is a lot of wastage in terms of uh, the use of national resources to pay salaries for people who are not really needed you understand so if you cut uh, let's say additional recruitment of officers we are not at all as a nation you cut additional recruitment of officers you find that you save billions of quarter that means that the money you collect from ZRA will be able to sustain a much smaller civil service because the current administration has the belief that you create employment by employing additional civil servants on an you know a yearly basis you can't grow the economy like that you can't create uh, employment like that because that creation of employment is not sustainable when you talk about employment uh, creation you are talking about employment in the private sector not employment in the civil service okay uh, mr tembo the, the mines uh, you know we have investors now back in the mines yes what are the short-term benefits for that citizens should expect from this or the long-term benefits that your citizens uh, expect from this because we do know that uh, the UPND have a plan to uh, be churning out you know uh, three million metric tons of of of, of copper in the next 10 years so uh, what should citizens expect from this first of all i want to mention that uh, from our standpoint we were very disappointed that government decided to sell that 51% uh, shareholding in Mopani, which uh, Grenko had given up. We believe that uh, as a nation, if we had taken up that shareholding and we ran the mines ourselves as Zambia, it would have been more lucrative to us. Because when you look at the amount of money which uh, that IRH is investing in the mines, it is money that can be mobilized from Workman's Compensation Fund as well as NAPSA. We can fund the operations of the mines ourselves. But uh, that is besides the point, Peter. To answer your question, when you look at the mining sector, uh, it is a key sector for this country. And uh, there are other countries in the region which rely entirely on mining for the sustenance of their economy. Mm -hmm. And these countries have done far much better than we have. When you talk about mining, you need to talk about the benefits to the economy and the benefits to the people. Number one benefit, you are talking about employment. When you go to these mines, even the new uh, mine owners, you realize that uh, the majority of the people who are hired uh, from supervisor to managerial to director level are foreigners. That means that uh, the people who graduate from CBU, from University of Zambia, doing mining, doing metallurgy, doing electrical engineering, doing mechanical engineering, end up roaming the streets, they end up starting shops, selling hardware at town center. You understand? So we are not benefiting in terms of employment creation. When you talk about taxation, uh, when you do a small comparison in terms of uh, the contribution of the mining sector now as a sector, not just one company, but as a sector, compared to the contribution of the mining sector when we were owning the mines under ZCCM, you realize that when the mines were owned by ZCCM, their contribution 
contribution to GDP was around 25%. And their contribution to the tax pool was around the same amount, 25%. Today, the contribution of the mining sector is around 22-23% uh, in terms of GDP. Their contribution to the tax pool is less than 5%. So there is a mismatch there in terms of the whole sector. Mm. What that tells you is that we as a nation are not getting our full benefit in terms of taxation from the mining sector. And that is in terms of taxes, whether you're talking about corporate tax, withholding tax, uh, value-added tax, and so on and so forth. That is number two benefit which we are not able to get. Number three, when the mines were owned by ZCCM, we had vibrant manufacturing uh, industries in Dora there. The entire Dora was a manufacturing hub, and it was feeding the mining sector. Mm -hmm. You understand? You go to Dora today, there is no manufacturing company. Dora is reduced to a ghost town. Why? Because Almost all the mines, including Vedanta, they even uh, shifted their procurement centers to other countries. The procurement center for Vedanta before they were kicked out was moved to South Africa. Uh, the manufacturing center for uh, all these other mines are either in India or in Canada and so on and so forth. That is where they procure from. So we are promoting the industries in those countries while we don't promote a local manufacturing industry. So we don't get a benefit from that. I, I can go on and on and on, Peter, but the bottom line is that the coming on board of IRH does not change the equation. It doesn't change the fact that as a nation, we have never fully benefited from the mining sector. You, you touched on something to do with taxes and said, you know, we're not getting enough taxes from, from, from this sector. How can that be rectified? In a lot of ways, in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, when you look at, uh, you know, when you talk about tax, there are different types of tax. You talk about corporate tax, it is a tax uh, uh, on profits. So you need to calculate the profit. You need to look at your sales and then your costs. And the corporate tax is very difficult for the mines here because the mines are always coming up with ingenious ways of uh, reducing that tax. So what they essentially do is that, first of all, they underestimate uh, uh, they underestimate the value of the sales. Mm. So when they sell the copper, they sell the copper, they don't sell it at the ruling price of copper on the London Metal Exchange, which might be maybe uh, you know $10,000 per metric ton. They don't sell it at that price. They sell it at a far lower price. They'll sell it at, say, $6,000. And the company they sell it to is their subsidiary. You understand? Mm -hmm. So they sell to their subsidiary at a lower price, which means the total sales they'll declare here in Zambia is lower than what they would have declared had they sold at the market rate. And then that subsidiary is the one which then sells now at the market rate. So they are essentially shifting profits to their outside this subsidiary. When you talk about costs, they inflate costs. When they want to buy machinery, instead of buying machinery at the market rate, let's say a Caterpillar is $2 million, they will buy that Caterpillar not from an independent third party, no. They'll buy that Caterpillar from one of their subsidiaries and they'll sell them that Caterpillar at $5 million, inflated by $3 million. And then that subsidiary is the one now which buys from the market at the standard price. What that means is that uh, when they prepare their financial statements, their sales is grossly understated and their costs are grossly inflated. At the end of the day, the mines always make losses. And for as long as they make a loss, they don't pay tax. And um, the response to that is simple. We need to find innovative ways to ensure that the mines pay a fair amount of tax. But there's no political will. That is the part that is missing. You've got ZRA fighting with the mines every day. Uh, when you look in the budget, you'll find that there's an amendment to the Income Tax Act every year. There's an amendment to the Value Added Tax every year. Why they are trying to close loopholes which the mines identify, which they use to dodge tax. Mm. But they are not going anywhere. It's a cat and mouse game. Why? Because there's no political will. We don't have political will from the president. We don't have political will from the Minister of Finance. Why? These individuals don't mean well for the country. So what happens is that the mines will have a side chart with this. When you look at um, what happens when a bank or indeed any other deposit taking financial institution falls, hmm. we have examples. We have uh, SEDZAM, which collapsed. It was a deposit taking microfinance institution. We have intermarket discount. Uh, banking operation which collapsed which was uh, a, a bank of course it was deposit taking what happens is that um, when uh, the bank of zambia takes over the running of the bank in terms of uh, liquidating it 
they do not realize enough assets when they liquidate the bank or whatever institution it is to be able to pay back depositors their full amounts. So when you look at the case of Sedzam, depositors were paid, I think, about 17% of their deposits, which means if you had 100,000 in your account, you only paid 17,000. In the case of intermarket banking corporation, they were paid about 30%, which means if you had 100,000 kwacha in the account, you only paid 30,000. You understand? And that is your money, Peter. That, those are your savings. That is money you worked for. That is money you toiled for, arguing with Sean Tembo on radio. And now that money is taken away and only a fraction of it given back to you. Is that fair? The answer is no, it's not fair. Now, this case of invest trust and this collapse is not going to be any different. You understand? It's not going to be any different. I would be shocked if uh, the Bank of Zambia paid back uh, even more than 50% of the depositors' money uh, uh, when they finish winding down the bank. And that winding down, again, it takes a lot of time. It takes years. You understand? While the money loses value in terms of inflation and so on and so forth. Now, we have this case whereby the first lady, Mrs. Uh, Mutinta Hichilema, got a donation of 100,000 kwacha from Invest Trust Bank on the 19th of uh, December 2023, which is barely three months ago. Okay. That donation might have been given, uh, might have been received by her in good faith. She might not have known the health of the bank at that particular time. Of course, the managing director gave it in bad faith because as a managing director, he is privy to the operations of the bank and he knew or should have known that the bank is about to collapse, that the bank does not have the financial strength necessary to be making these kinds of donations. Mm. So one side, we know for sure it was bad faith. But on the side of the first lady, uh, it might have been in good faith for her to receive that donation. But now you fast forward to uh, this day. The bank has collapsed and it's barely a few months after you were given this money. This money is part of the depositor's money. So it's a matter, it's a matter of uh, 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 being morally upright to say, look, this money which I got, the 100,000, is part of depositor's money. So let me take it back so that it can add to the pool of the depositor's funds which uh, will be available for distribution to the various account holders at Invest Trust. So that instead of them maybe only getting 30 percent they can get the two percent of their money or instead of getting 40 percent they can get 45 percent of their money it's a matter of uh more being morally upright and the fact that the first lady uh mrs mtita Ichirema, up to this day has not responded to not only our cause but the cause of various other stakeholders for her to return that hundred thousand kwacha to me, it shows the levels of moral bankruptcy that our first lady has. She is morally bankrupt. For any person who is morally upright, it shouldn't have taken calls from either Sean Tembo or any other sector for you to take back that money. And you know this incident, uh, Peter? It does not only speak to the moral bankruptcy of the first lady, but also of President Hakainde Ichirema. Because President Hakainde Ichirema is the husband to Mutita Ichirema. And President Hakainde Ichirema knows what has happened. He knows what has happened to investors. He has been in the business environment. He knows that when a financial institution collapses, only a fraction of the depositors' funds are given back to them. And that it takes years for those funds to be given back to them. So, President Hakainde Ichirema should have advised his wife to say, sweetheart, listen, this money you got, this 100,000, uh, this money is smelly money. It's not good for our reputation. Let's give it back. He should have done that if he, he was a morally upright person. Mr. But Tembo. it speaks volumes about his moral integrity. L let's look at where the 100,000 was channeled to. This was. It doesn't for, matter for the where it went, Peter. The to, bottom line is that it was given gonna, to her. She was going to help the less privileged because we do know that the officer of the, of the, of the first lady or the first lady's. Uh, it's, it's an honorary job. So she's, she's going to. She, she's working with. Uh, you know, uh, with associations she's working with to help the less privileged. So it's Peter, not like it's personal money that she's banking. Does, does it, doesn't that warrant why you know she, she, she took that money and used it to help the less privileged in our society? I'll, I'll give two answers to that, Peter. All right. Number one, the issue of um, uh, saying that uh, these people run these one-person uh, NGOs, take the money and give it to the underprivileged, it is a fallacy in most instances. They use it for themselves. Only a small fraction of it is 
actually given to the people whom they obtain that money by advocating for. Uh, that is why they will never subject their to my smoke and timber organizations to an audit. You understand? If uh, indeed those monies are channeled to the less privileged, uh, I challenge uh, the first lady to uh, avail her audited financial statements, whereby we can see that the beneficiaries of the money she collects in the name of helping the underprivileged actually goes to the people she advocates for. I'll tell you, I can bet. I can bet whatever money I have in my wallet. Let me check, Peter. Just one minute. I think I've got about 2,000 questions. I bet 2,000 questions. Yes, that uh, those financial statements, if her country organization is audited, the majority of the money would have gone to the underprivileged people that she claims she advocates for. But even if uh, that is the case, the other response, Peter, is that if the depositors of Invest Trust Bank wanted to donate part of their deposits to the underprivileged, they would have identified an NGO to donate to. You understand? If I have 100,000 quarter in Invest Trust Bank, I'm a depositor at Invest Trust Bank. I want to help the underprivileged. I will get a portion of that money myself, not someone getting it under false pretenses. Someone like Mutita Ishirema. No, no. But By myself, it, but it's I'll get a portion of decision. my depositors' money in the bank mm. there. I'll get a 2,000 or 3,000. I'll identify a charity, whether Red Cross or whatever it is, and I'll donate that money voluntarily. So you cannot illegally get money from an institution and then uh, you want to say, no, it was used for a good purpose. What about the people who put that money? But Those are people's how savings. Is this, Mr. Temple, you understand? How Those is, are people's savings. How are you pinning this on the First Lady? Uh, because if she is advocating, I need financing, I need to help the less privileged in, in society. Mm -hmm. And the corporate world responds mm -hmm. by donating to her organization. Using and, other people's and, money. And, and uh, well, that's on the corporation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How is it coming back to her when it's the corporation <coughs> that has decided so, Peter. to... to this money into the programs that she's put forward to the it people to say we need help with this with this project it comes down to my area position on this matter if you remember uh, at the very beginning i told you to say look, when you look at the whole equation we know for a fact that on the part of the invest trust managing director he did not act in good faith because he knew the health of his institution. He knew that this money I'm donating, this 100,000 which I'm donating, these are depositors' funds, and that the bank can collapse anytime. He knew, or should have known. But on the part of uh, the first lady, on the part of Mutinta Ishirema, we can give her the benefit of the doubt uh, that she might have not known, which means she might have received that money in good faith. I said that at the beginning. Yeah. But what makes it wrong is for her to insist on keeping that money even after she knows that that money was illegally given to her. But is, her it, is she keeping it for personal use, Mr. Temple? Uh, listen, uh, Peter. Mm. Her insistence to keep the hand of the donation, which money she now knows, she might have not known at that time, but now she knows that this is depositor's money. Her insistence to keep on, to hold on to that money is what makes it immoral, is what makes it illegal, is what makes the first lady to be tainted in the eyes of the public. You get the point? Is she using if it for she personal had, use, Mr. If Temple? she had graciously returned that money to investors and said, oh, uh, in view of the collapse of the bank and in view of uh, the fact that uh, we are seeing pictures of uh, depositors queuing for their money, others are even crying. Did you see the picture of that lady at um, yes. investors or yes. bought a branch in Kitwe? Yes. The one who was crying and rolling on the floor. Yes. Yes, someone is crying and rolling on the floor because of their deposit. Maybe that money was maybe 5,000 or 7,000, but that's the only money she had. And you, you got 100,000, which you never worked for, in the name of a donation from that MD, Shirimi. Eh? Shirimi. You understand? You get that money. Uh, it is morally uh, wrong, Peter. And if you don't see that, then you are morally bankrupt. And uh, for as long as the first lady keeps on holding on to that 100,000 from investors, I've got no doubt in my mind that she's a morally bankrupt person. And not only herself, but also her husband, who happens to be our Republican president, Mr. Haka Inde Ichirema. For as long as he's not able to advise his wife to return that 100,000 kwacha which she got from investors, then we have a morally bankrupt Republican president. So, but just that, Mr. Tembo, is she using it for personal use? That's, that's the question. And we've, we've gathered that she is going to help the less privileged and this is a donation she has no control over and i'm glad that you've you've identified that she's she has no control over who donates to her it, it's it's not on her uh, on on who uh, you know who donates to her but let's look at where this money is being channeled also shouldn't we be considering that 
It doesn't matter. We've uh, dwelled on this for too long. Let's move on. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. No, it, doesn't it, doesn't matter it doesn't matter where she spends the money. It doesn't matter. It's not her money. It's the depositors' money. That's what matters. Mr. Tembo, mm -hmm. um, the impact of the collapse of Infrastrust Bank. Mm -hmm. What does this do on the economy? That is extremely regrettable. Uh, that um, such a big bank had to collapse. And uh, what makes this collapse very peculiar is the fact that it was majority owned by government through ZCCM investment holdings and um, uh, further through IDC, Industrial Development Corporation, where uh, President Hagainde Ichirema is the board chairman. You understand? So you've got uh, uh, the shareholder, the major shareholder, which owned more than 71% of investors, being IDC, uh, where the Republican president is the majority shareholder. I mean, the, 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 the board chairman. You understand? So it, it's very peculiar because when you look at um, the money which investors needed to maintain, sustain their operations, I don't think we are talking about uh, anything more than $10 million. Uh, but we have a president by virtue of him being board chairman of IDC, who decided that uh, it was better, excuse me, it was better for investors to collapse and for hundreds of thousands of customers to lose their deposits than for his government to uh, recapitalize investors. So a person who makes such a decision, uh, 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 their um, uh, uh, foreign banks. You realize that when this ba these banks came and set up in Zambia, <coughs> they were not profitable for some time. And the only reason they are still there today is because they are uh, holding companies, their parent companies kept injecting in money, they kept injecting in money while they were making operational losses until such a time that they stabilized and they were now profitable. That is why you are seeing them now, they are vibrant. They didn't just come to the Zambian market and become vibrant, no. The one year has been continuously and consistently increasing the statutory reserve ratio. In some instances, increasing by as much as 300 basis points. As we are speaking today, the statutory reserve ratio is standing at about 17%. So, let, uh, Peter, allow me just to dwell a bit and explain what the statutory reserve ratio means to the banking sector, if you allow me. So, what the SRR means is that... Um, the banks will collect deposits from the public, people who hold that money. Others uh, hold that money in their current accounts. Mm -hmm. Others hold the money in the fixed deposit accounts. Others hold it in all sorts of accounts. Some interest reserve ratio. Every now and then they are increasing the state reserve ratio, thereby increasing the amount of money that banks need to keep at Bank of Zambia lying idle, which they cannot give out in terms of loans so that they earn interest. So by increasing the statutory reserve ratio every now and then, you are reducing the profitability of a, a, a bank, of the entire banking sector. And by so doing, those banks which are not very strong, they end up collapsing. And the reason the Bank of Zambia would normally increase the statutory reserve ratio is their first belief that it will help to quell the depreciation of the quacha. Uh, <laughs> according to the misplaced thinking of the central bank, they believe that the depreciation of the quacha is because of oversupply of uh, the currency in the market. And that by increasing the statutory reserve ratio, uh, they will be reducing the amount of money supply, which is a totally misplaced kind of thinking. I wonder what kind of economics that those people sitting at Boz uh, did, because it never makes sense whatsoever. You understand? So that is the situation. You've got the central bank, which comes up with policies that undermine these financial institutions. And uh, the most affected, of course, are local institutions, because they do not have big parent companies outside the country who can pump in resources to recapitalize them when they are about to fall. You understand? Whereby even if they are owned by government like investors was the board chair, the president, Hakainde Ichirema, decides to say no, it's better for investors to fall than to get money from Ministry of Finance and pump in to recapitalize the bank. That kind of thinking is totally wrong. It can never take this economy anywhere. And for as long as we have individuals, both in State House as well as at Bank of Zambia, who are not able to think properly, who are not able to think straight, the economy of this country, Peter, 
it's not going anywhere. Mr. Tambo, uh, there's an issue to do with uh, you know the Catholic priest, uh, Father Chewe Mukosa. Uh, last week he was sent to the police for questioning, but the call out was later cancelled. I want to find out from you: is, is there selective justice in the control? Is there a selective application of the law? Of course, there is. There's no question about it. You know, any Zambian who believes that um, there is a fair application of the law, um, uh, their sanity should be questioned. Any Zambian, their sanity should be questioned who believes that there is a fair application of the law. Because the writing is on the wall. You understand? If you read uh, or view that video by Father Mkosa, where I was talking about the issue of road shedding, did he insult anybody in there? Did you find any insults? Of course you didn't. Did this disparage anybody? He didn't. So, on what basis did the Zambia Police Service decide that they needed to uh, summon Father Mkosa for the offense of hate speech? Hate speech towards who? Zesco? Or government? That is ridiculous. But uh, anyone who has been following the actions of uh, the Zambia Police and the UPND government will realize that uh, the UPND are using the Zambia police as their number one tool. They believe that anyone who wants to challenge them, they'll simply arrest them on frivolous charges and make sure that those cases are channeled to major streets who get instructions from state house. Major streets who are going to ensure there's a conviction even if there's no evidence. That is their game plan. That is what they've been doing. Are they yes. saying so our, you have our justice system is compromised? Highly compromised, uh, Peter. Highly compromised. Highly compromised. We have a situation whereby um, uh, the judiciary has lost all credibility. I'll give you a small example. A few months ago, we went to file a complaint uh, at the Magistrates Court against uh, the UPND Secretary General, Batuka Emenda, a criminal complaint for hate speech. I'm sure you remember where he referred to the Archbishop of Lusaka, uh, Dr. Arik Banda, as the Lucifer of Zambia. That is clear hate speech. You're saying someone is Satan, and this is the head of a church. So that is clear hate speech. So we filed a complaint, and uh, <clears throat> we wrote to DPP, um, what is the name of that guy, Gilbert, Gilbert Piri, to say, give us consent to privately prosecute this matter. Uh, first of all, he said, uh, you haven't given evidence. So we sent him the evidence. We gave him the video uh, where Imenda was saying those words. A clear video. That is evidence. And we also told him we have four witnesses who are willing to testify. Then uh, Gilbert Piri did it for a good uh, uh, month or two. Uh, he wasn't responding. <laughs> then the next, when the matter came up for mention, we were informed, we were given a ruling that um, uh, the DPP had declined the consent you understand despite the ample evidence he declined the consent um uh, so from there we decided okay we are going to pursue this matter you know because this is unfair application of the law we've got individuals who are being given two years for hate speech we've got the shimbakambwiri who was given five months for hate speech and the dpp is even appealing that sentence he wants two years on shimbakambwiri so that is double standards so we said okay fine we're going to take this case to the high court for judicial review and uh, we proceeded to uh chair can you give me that uh, search we went to the high uh, to the magistrate's court uh to get a record of the letter Okay, that uh, Gilbert Piri wrote to the court where he declined to give consent because we need that if we're going to file for judicial review. We also uh, wanted the copy of the ruling that was rendered by the court where the court dismissed that. And uh, on file, there's nothing on file. So the letter from Gilbert Piri is not on file. The ruling is not on file. Here is our search. I'm sure you can read it. Uh, that is the search that was made. There's nothing on file. So you have a situation whereby the judiciary is being treated as a contender of the UPND. Uh, they, 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 they can render any judgment or ruling they want uh, without any evidence or without any documents. You understand? How, uh, how is it that uh, the matter was dismissed if DPP never wrote the letter to uh, deny consent? 
You understand? So it speaks volumes about the underhand methods of the UPND administration, their use of the police, their use of the judiciary to undermine the democracy of this country. And uh, me, my appeal to the people is simple. You know, when we politicians are speaking in, uh, to the public like this, they think we are joking. They think we are joking. But my appeal to the people is simple. If the people of Zambia are happy with the way the UPND is mismanaging the affairs of the nation, the way they are pocketing money, public money into their pockets through consent judgments of their cadres, the way they are selling mines to themselves through proxies uh, like uh, IRH, the way they are mismanaging the economy, if they are happy, then well and good. But if they are not happy and they want a more sober government in 2026, it will not be enough for the people just to vote. That will not be enough. What is needed, let me just finish. Yeah. What is needed in 2026 is for the people to actively participate in protecting the vote. Because I've got no doubt in my mind, Peter, that the reason the UPND are so arrogant, the reason the UPND don't care about public sentiment, don't care about uh, their political suicide, is because they've got a plan to rig the elections in 2026. And it is up to us, the people, it is up to the people out there to protect the vote. If people just vote and they go home and uh, they expect the result to reflect their will, then they are dreaming. They need to be actively involved at polling stations, monitoring the votes and ensuring that any UPND member who comes to try and rig the elections, the people effect a citizen's arrest. That is the only way that the will of the people will be reflected in the results of the ballot. You said something, Mr. Temple, regarding um, IRH saying that they are a proxy of the UPND. Is yes. there, do you have any evidence to that effect that uh, IRH is a proxy of any UPND member or the UPND itself? First of all, Peter, uh, the starting point is the price at which the 51 percent was sought. Maybe before we even get to the price, uh, the starting point is the procedure that was taken. When you read the, the Constitution, if I'm not mistaken, it should be uh, Article 263. Uh, it makes it very clear that uh, if uh, the government is disposing of any asset, any asset, uh, it needs to take that uh, motion to parliament and uh, the National Assembly has to vote on that and uh, they have to give uh, a majority of two-thirds. Once you have a two-thirds majority, that is when you can dispose of a national asset. We all agree that Mopani is a national asset, isn't it? Yes, it is. And we all agree that it was sold, isn't it? And we all agree that uh, there was no motion that was tabled before parliament to approve that sale, isn't it? So the procedure is illegal. So it speaks about personal motivation of Haka in the HLM to sell the mine without following procedure. That is number one. Number two, you come to the price at which Mopani was sold. The price at which Mopani was sold is uh, the price uh, that uh, even when you sell Findeco House, the money you realize is higher. You understand? So it was sold at a given away price. That is number two. So when someone doesn't follow procedure and then proceeds to sell a national asset at a giveaway price, and then you fast forward, you go to the tail end of the transaction. You look at the people who are sitting on the board of the subsidiary of investment, uh, 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 IRH, uh, investment resource holdings, or whatever it is they call themselves. You look at the people who are sitting on the subsidiaries, that company which bought the, the, the Black Mountain. You find that one of Haka uh, uh, Hichinema's long established business partners is sitting on that board. So, Peter, if it walks like a duck, it squirrels like a duck, and it looks like a duck, then it's a duck. So, this looks like corruption, it smells like corruption, it is corruption, Peter. There's no question about it. This is corruption. This is Haka and HDMI selling Mopani to himself. There's no question about it. Any Zambian who doesn't believe that, they need to have their sanity examined. I've got no question which, about it. Which individual is that that is uh, on, I that, don't on, on, on that? On I don't that, want to mention names. I don't want to mention names, but it is people who are widely reported. I don't want to mention names um, uh, for. Well, you brought it up to well, us, Mr. Temple. That's why, that's why we want to know, because you, you have the information. That's why the Zambian people, you, you owe it to the Zambian people to, to let them know what's going on. Peter, you are the journalist. Do some research. I've given you an assignment. Do some research. Next time I feature here, you say, oh, mm. ha, President Dembo, I found out. That is a job.
Mm. A journalist, find out. You have the information at, at your fingertips, Mr. <laughs> Tembo. You did the research. <laughs> you did your investigations. You you know which which company this is. This, this is an individual who is widely reported. People mm. have reported in the media about mm. him, but me personally, I don't want to mention his name. I, I don't find his name palatable in my mouth. Mr. Tembo, we're still talking about issues to do with uh, uh, you know the Zambia police. Mm -hmm. um, because I want to find out how you, as PEP, are faring and how you are recruiting. Because we did hear from the IG, he says you won't be allowing any uh, opposition to hold any rallies. Mm -hmm. um, how are you mobilizing your party with the perpetual ban of, of, of rallies in the country? It is very difficult, of course. Um, <clears throat> it is very difficult. Um, uh, uh, because w when you go and mobilize, whatever you say, next thing you find a call out, you are being harassed by uh, uh, the police uh, for silly reasons. Uh, but uh, this is a passing phase, Peter. It's a passing phase. We had a time uh, not so long ago, some of us were old enough, when, uh, you know, the mere mention of trying to challenge the president was treason. Just by you saying, uh, I want to be the next president of Zambia, that was treason. That is where we're coming from, in the days of Kaunda. So what we are experiencing now, of course it is uh, bad for democracy, and uh, um, we've moved from bad to waste, but uh, it is not something that is insurmountable. It is something that we're going to overcome. And uh, it doesn't matter how well um, uh, President Takayenda Ichirema believes that uh, he's got this whole equation figured out, how well he, he believes he's got um, uh, everything plotted in terms of how he will ensure that he remains the warm yaya of Zambia. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is that even other presidents who were there before thought they had a perfect plan. They thought that they were going to be the warm yaya of Zambia. Others wanted to go for a third term. Others wanted to do all sorts of things. You understand? But what happened? They failed. So my advice to President Hakainda Ichirema is that no matter how well crafted his plan to hijack the democracy of this country and turn it into a dictatorship and become a president of Wamiyaya in Zambia, his plans shall never work, not in Zambia. He might uh, draw some inspiration when he goes for those meetings, international meetings, he meets uh, a dictator seated next to him, he tells him, yeah, I'll be uh, sworn in for my sixth term. He says, ah, oh, how did you do it? Then he shares how he did it in their respective country. And the guy comes to Zambia, he believes that he can do the same and it will work in Zambia. My advice to President Hagaende Ichirema is that your plans, no wonder how well crafted, will never work in Zambia. At the right time in 2026, if you don't get the requisite number of votes, you'll be kicked out. If you resist to be kicked out, you're going to be bundled out in a land cruiser because Zambia is a democracy. You understand? So how are you, how are you mobilizing? How's PEP mobilizing? We are mobilizing, Peter. If I disclose how we mobilize, the next thing I will find the Zambezi squad is closing our loopholes of mobilization. So I don't want to talk about how we mobilize. Just know that we mobilize and we are confident about our, um, uh, you know, our prospects in 20, you know, 2026, whether at that time we are going to be part of an alliance or we are going to stand by ourselves. We are very confident about our prospects and um, we look forward. Speaking of alliances, uh, yesterday we did hear from uh, Home Affairs and Internal Security Minister, uh, Honorable Jack Mwim. Uh, yesterday he declared the United Quacha Alliance as an illegal entity. What's your comment on this development? Um, Peter, the <coughs> United Quacha Alliance, those are our brothers and sisters. And... Um, uh, for me, I wouldn't want to go into the details of what it is they are doing right and what it is they are doing wrong. Because when I discuss that, mm. I'll be giving ideas to Haka Inde Ichirema and his regime to try and undermine us as the opposition. So, as Sean Tembo, as PEP, Patriots for Economic Progress, of course... Uh, uh, we compete among ourselves. We compete with Fred member socialists, we compete with UCA, we compete with Harikara. But uh, uh, after all that competition among ourselves, we remain united uh, in the fact that Haka Inde Ishirem has failed and he needs to be replaced. So to answer your question, as a compromise to your question, mm. instead of me commenting on UCA specifically, allow me to comment on opposition alliances in general because UCA is not the first opposition alliance. There was uh, there's that alliance which uh, President 
Nanda initiated before Oka. Then Oka came. Then there is this other runs that came after Oka initiated by uh, President Peter Sinkamba. It's called what? The People's Pact. So if you ask me uh, what my view is about these alliances and uh, what I feel uh, could be done better with regard to these alliances, then mm. I can share with you that. But uh, us as opposition, we come together under an alliance as we head towards 2021. And we should be united as we face the UPND so that we don't have spoiled votes. Um, uh, the challenge I see among most alliances is that uh, there's an element of lack of seriousness in the sense that uh, uh, there is uh, a hurry. Uh, people are, are too much in a hurry to go to the public and uh, and uh, and uh, talk about the alliance instead of working on the model that the alliance should follow instead of uh, doing the groundwork needed instead of finalizing on the memorandum of understandings instead of bringing on board key stakeholders not only political parties but buy in from other stakeholders like you know church mother bodies civil society organizations you need to approach them before you announce to the world to say we have this alliance you need to announce them tell them they are an alliance and yet you haven't drawn up any memorandum of understanding you haven't done the registration you haven't done this you haven't done that you haven't done so you are jumping the gun and once you jump the gun it then becomes a bit of a challenge to now address those issues which you should have addressed at the very beginning before you made the uh, particular alliance project public you understand those are basic things so the approach matters a lot uh, remember peter i've been a member of uh, an alliance before way back before 2021 and uh, that alliance the way we did it is before we announced it to the public we sat among ourselves we drew up a memorandum of agreement we discussed how it was going to operate we discussed how we are going to field candidates and this and that you understand by the time it was being taken to the public uh the people used to hear of it as a rumor it was just a rumor hmm. so when we went to the public we were now confirming the rumor that people were hearing to say oh the rumor you are hearing is true this is who we are this is what we stand for this is what we intend to do so that is the stages. Those are the stages, in my view, that alliance should follow, as opposed to rushing to the media, rushing to the public, and then after you go to the public, you want now to address the things you should have addressed before you made the alliance project public. Does it mean that you, you will not be joining uh, you know, this United Quarter Alliance anytime soon? Why are you insisting on UQA? Uh, why not uh, uh, on uh, what do they call that alliance? Uh, People's Pact. Mm. People's Pact. Why not the other alliance? The, the bottom line, Peter, is that for us as people and mm. for me as Sean Temple, joining the alliance, we would be enhancing our prospects in 2026. As things stand at the moment, I feel that if we joined any of the alliances in their current form, instead of enhancing our prospects in 2026, we would actually be hindering our prospects. So our view is that if uh, issued uh, on his visit to Western Province, and I feel that uh, it was uh, uh, misreported by the media, mm. because uh, President Member did not say he would declare um, Western Province as Barotsland. What he said is that uh, he is uh, going to change the name mm -hmm. of Western Province to Barotsland. You understand? Changing the name, meaning that it will remain a province of Zambia, but it will be referred to as Barotsland Province. That is what uh, President Member said. I read his statement on his page. Um, so, so I don't see anything wrong with that in terms of changing the name of uh, the province. Uh, we had other presidents who came and created an additional province. We've, we've got Muchinga province. Mm, so yeah. those administrative issues are neither here nor there. Uh, I, I think what made uh, President Member's uh, statement controversial is the misreporting by the media who wanted to portray that um, he's going to allow uh, Barotsland to secede and become a, a separate country, which is not what President uh, uh, Fred Member said. What's, what's your stance on this aspect? The issue to do with Bar Barotsland. We know that there are some, uh, you know, uh, we've heard individuals who are representing Barotsland saying they want to secede from Zambia <coughs> and become an independent state. Mm. What's your take on this? Uh, of course, uh, my view is that uh, Zambia.
development taking place in those areas despite the fact that the area is rich with copper and other minerals and uh, uh, the, the, a good portion of the country's GDP is drawn from that province and secondly if you heard what the senior chief uh, said mm -hmm. a few uh, months ago is that uh, most of the land is actually uh, given out in terms of uh, mining concessions such that uh, in one of the areas even the chief's palace was part of uh, the mining concession in other words the people themselves don't have uh, access to land you understand so you have these complaints from different uh, parts of zambia including local province um, uh, all of which in my view are varied when you look at uh, the development of uh, this country it is uh, largely focused in rusaka you understand? To the exclusion of other remote provinces. And that is something that has to be addressed. Yeah, okay. Uh, in our view, we believe that the solution to that, if you read the manifesto, our manifesto, the PEP manifesto, we believe that the solution to that lies in creating a federal system. Okay. A federal system where uh, the provinces will be partially self-governing. When you say partially self-governing, you are talking about the provinces having a provincial government mm -hmm. and having a provincial assembly and being able to correct certain types of taxes for their own development. You understand? And they will be able to develop based on the money they generate and how they run their own affairs in the province. That, Peter, I strongly believe that it would help even the attitude of traditional leaders towards investments to these locations if you pay attention to the attitude of the local people uh, when there is a big investment coming in their area their attitude is usually negative you look at the luangwa copper project which was stopped by uh, government where the government withdrew the the license you look at uh, the proposed uh, setting up of a nuclear power plant in uh, chief commercial's area in chonga district uh, that was under the SATA administration. You look at various uh, big projects which are proposed in certain locations. You find that the attitude of the people in these locations is usually uh, it is uh, loofed by three different colors of ironing sheets. Uh, there is purple, blue, and yellow. You can see that they were even so doba doba chabe malata yopangira paras yawa chief. But that is the chief dome where the mining is taking place. Why can't you take care of the people, the owners of the resources? So. My view is that the true solution, the best solution to the Balosa and the issue, as well as the issue of the complaints that come from other provinces other than Balosa is to have a federal system of government. Mr. Tembo, let's uh, allow the people to be part of this conversation. Uh, you can call us on 0974-870-877-0950-955-877. In case you're just joining it, we have uh, Pep President Sean Tembo on the hot seat this morning. So give us a call now on those two lines. You're listening to the hot seat on Hot FM 87.7. It's time for you to call now and get involved. Call now and get involved. Good morning. You're through to the hot seat. Who do we have on the line? Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Morning okay. to you. What, what's your yes, name? Uh, uh, yes, no one coma. No one coma. Please go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now, uh, just a quick comment. Uh, President Campbell, you say that uh, had we run our minds, we would be in a much better place than we were like a time of this year now let me just put it to you you are saying that this is a new contribute 25 percent uh to taxes right in terms of profit now the question that i want to put to you how can a mine which at the point that was being uh, profile for privatization between 1997 and the year 2001 when it was actually privatized was getting money from the government to sustain its operations the CCM was losing a million dollars per month Mr. Nkoma, are you done? Hello? 
seems to be on the line, but we can't hear what he's saying. Hello, Mr. Nkoma? Do try call us back uh, to finish that point that you are trying to uh, address. It's 0974-870-877-0950-955-877. Those lines will get you to, to the hot seat this morning. Hello, good morning. Uh, good morning, Pizzi. Morning to you. What's your name? Uh, good morning, Mr. Tembo. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, this is Peter on your line. All right, Peter, please go ahead with your question or contribution. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Mr. Tembo, after the, uh, I just want, uh, want to take you back. Uh, I want you to explain uh, Article 252 of our Constitution. Because uh, most of our Zambians, they don't know that we have uh, the accountant general who doesn't qualify to be in that office. Uh, they fired the accountant general uh, uh, who was very young and he also fired the auditor general. Now, if you read the article uh, 252, clause 1 and 2, I don't think the, the auditor general uh, and the accountant general qualified to be in that office. So I just want you to shed more light and educate the Zambian. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. It's 0974-870-877-0950-955-877. We have Pep President Sean Tembo on the hot seat this morning. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning to you. Morning to you. What's your name? Good morning, Mr. Sean Tembo. Uh, good morning, madam. Oh, sorry. Uh, do try call us back. The line just uh, dropped there. It's 0974-870-877-0950-955-877. We'd like to hear from you this morning. Hello, good morning. Thank you. Morning, Peter. Morning to you. Good morning, All right, well, Thomas, please uh, go ahead with your question or contribution. See, while doing nothing, if you can have the democracy, when there is all in this country, you learn out from those offices. Do what is right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Let's allow Mr. Tembo to respond to those uh, uh, three questions. Mr. Tembo, please tackle those three. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so the first question was from Mr. Noon Koma. I believe it is the same uh, Mr. Noon Koma that. Uh, uh, is the losing UPND candidate for Kasanengwa, who is uh, recently uh, was the board chair for uh, Development Bank of Zambia, which collapsed, and uh, has now been appointed to be board chair of uh, uh, the National Road Fund. I, I believe it is the same person. I believe so too, because it sounded like him. Yeah. Okay, so his argument was that um, uh, ZCCM. First of all, he says uh, it wouldn't have benefited us to run Mopani ourselves uh, because uh, the last time we ran the mines under ZCCM, uh, the mines were making losses uh, towards the end of the UNIP administration. I, I find it very, very, um, uh, you know, very, very uh, awkward to have a senior. Um, uh, individual and member of the UPND who believes that Zambians cannot learn uh, the economic affairs of this nation and uh, wants to use uh, what happened during the UNIP regime as justification for that. You know, most people don't understand what happened uh, prior to KK coming out of office those last five years. What happened there is that uh, the prices of copper on the world market. First of all, our economy was 100% dependent on copper, uh, copper exports. And we made a lot of money out of uh, copper exports. That is the money that we used to build this country. That is the money we used to build uh, uh, all these electricity supplying uh, and generating facilities. The money we used to build uh, Lusaka City, those uh, Findeco House, Zimco House. That is the money we used to build the University of Zambia and all the other facilities across the nation. That was money from copper. And uh, that was the time when uh, prices of copper on the world market were good. And we all know that prices of copper, just like any other commodity, they fluctuate on the world market. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you remember, Peter, that um, uh, right about 1992, prices of copper really shot up 
all the way up to about 1996. That is why we did not immediately sell the, the, the mines under ZCCM. It was only when we suffered another uh, relapse of uh, uh, copper prices on the market that the idea of selling off the mines came now around 1996. You understand? So in my view, all we needed to do as a country was uh, to ensure that uh, we put aside some savings so that uh, when uh, copper prices on the world market fall, instead of us selling the mines, we would do scale down on the operations and reduce our operating cost and use the savings we had put aside for a rainy day to sustain the mines and wait for the uh, prices of copper to rise again. And then we make uh, a, 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 a windfall out of the sale of our copper because these prices, they keep going up and down. Mm -hmm. And it's not only copper, even oil. You remember during COVID, oil was selling at negative two dollars mm. per barrel, which means when you want a barrel of oil, instead of you who wants the oil to pay, the person who is giving you the oil is going to pay you two dollars. That is how low the prices of oil fell during COVID, the early days of COVID. So it is not only copper where you see these fluctuations in prices. Any commodity, you see the fluctuations. But did the Saudi Arabians give away their oil fields when the uh, oil prices were negative? They didn't. They kept them. Now they are making huge profits. Just like the people in Kuwait and all other places, Angola, they kept their oil fields. They didn't give them away because prices had become negative. The same applies to this country. Copper built Zambia. We were built by copper. And there is no reason whatsoever we should give it in the hands of any other uh, investor. If you remember, when Anglo-America uh, bought um, the, 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 uh, some mines, two mines, uh, and copper prices uh, fell around 2000, they, around 2001, they ran away. They abandoned those mines. You remember? Mm -hmm. Anglo-America. They abandoned the mines. So uh, even if we give them in the hands of the private sector, the private sector can also abandon those mines. So why should we give them to someone who we are not sure is going to sustain those mines where the prices are high or low? Who might abandon those uh, uh, mines? It's better we keep them as a nation and when prices are good, we enjoy the benefits, which are huge, by the way. And then when the prices are not good, we have a plan to ensure the sustainability of operations. We scale down, we just put the mines maybe on care and maintenance. And then prices rise, we resume production, just like that who will be benefiting as a nation. So the argument advanced by uh, Mr. Noah Nkoma, uh, in my view, is not a sound uh, argument. It does not make economic sense. And um, uh, perhaps it is that kind of mindset uh, that uh, uh, contributed to uh, the corruption of the bank that he was chairing, uh, Development Bank of Zambia. Because when you have someone with that kind of a mindset running a key financial institution, then obviously that financial institution is not going to go anywhere. All right, let's talk with the other two, uh, Peter and uh, Thomas. Yes, uh, Peter is very much on point. <clears throat> is very much on point. The article in question, Article 250, uh, 252, sub-article uh, 2, is very clear. It talks about the retirement age of the accountant general as well as the retirement age for the auditor general, which is 60 years. And the people who are occupying these offices, based on the information that I was able to gather, uh, I'm, I'm told there were some affidavits which they saw in a different matter mm -hmm. where they had to disclose their age. Uh, it is clear that their age, based on those sworn affidavits, is far higher than 60 years. So this is an irregularity. But this is not the only irregularity which the UPND administration is committing. I was just uh, talking about their failure to get a two-thirds um, approval from parliament to sell the 51% they sold out of uh, Mopani copper mines. Uh, so they continue to create these irregularities. They are drunk with power. We have a Republican president who is drunk with power. And um, it is very, very, you know, uh, uh, strange, uh, considering that uh, Mr. Akainde Ichirema spent more than 20 years 
uh, in opposition pointing out the wrongdoings of other regimes. He pointed out the wrongdoings of the Revi Manawasa regime. He was busy pointing out the wrongdoings of Rupia Banda administration, busy pointing out the wrongdoings of uh, Michael Chirufia Sata administration, the wrongdoings of uh, Edgar Chagwarungu administration, and then eventually the Zambian people are gracious enough to make him Republican president, and he's doing the exact wrong things. But uh, he's doing double, if not triple, the wrong things that other administrations were doing. You know, the actions of President Hagaende Ichirema has a huge potential to undermine our democracy in the sense that it is likely to frustrate people from voting because they feel that ah, we are politician or we are a politician still more they end up doing the wrong thing the wrong things so it is very regrettable and um, uh, well it depends on the mindset of the individual uh, people uh, uh, seek to be president of a nation for different reasons clearly uh, Mr. Akainde Chirema was seeking to be president of uh, Zambia for uh, the sake of his pockets and not for the sake of uplifting the people of Zambia out of uh, their high levels of poverty because even his responses to the people to the needs of the people they are very weak responses. Take, for instance, the issue of drought, Peter. Allow me to uh, uh, explain further on the issue of the drought. When you look at this drought, Peter, uh, it is unique. It is different from the drought we had in 1991. In the sense that the drought we had in 1991, whereas in terms of its scale and um, coverage, it was comparable to the current drought, in 1991, we were coming from a bumper harvest in 1990. We had a huge bumper harvest in 1990. So even if we had that drought in 1991, uh, where we were eating yellow maize and even the bags were eating and the bread was yellow because of uh, yellow flour, there was some carryover of the maize. This drought in 2024, it is coming at the backdrop of another poor harvest in the 2022-2023 farming uh, season. That poor harvest was not because of a drought, the rains were very good, but it was because of poor distribution of farming inputs. I'm sure you remember people sharing uh, fertilizer in medas. So what, what happened is that the harvest was very poor. For some of us who travel a lot across this country, I'll tell you that most parts of this country, especially the rural areas, did not have maize. Even prior to this drought, they did not have maize. So it's dry on the ground. And now you have a situation whereby we are in April now and uh, the UPND administration has not delivered a single bag of relief maize not a single bag of relief maize the vice president Mutare Narumango was uh, in western province and other parts of the country this past week and uh, 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 she was saying she's monitoring the hunger situation there but she never carried with her a single bag of relief maize to share with the people there. What the government is advocating for and what they keep announcing is that they have instructed uh, the Food Reserve Agency to open up their sheds and make what they call community sales of maize, meaning that direct sales of maize to the community as opposed to selling to mirrors. But the bottom line, Peter, is that you are still selling that maize to the community. Now, when you go to a rural area, people in rural areas do not have any source of income. You understand? They don't have any source of Their only source of income is the crops that they grow. They'll grow crops. When they sell the crops, that is the only money they have once a year. Mm. So when they have a drought, it simply means that they have zero food and zero income. So even when government says they have instructed the FRA to open up their sheds for community sales of maize, that maize, the 50 kg bag of maize, FRA is selling that maize for 550 to 600 kwacha, depending on the location. So the question then, which President Hakainde Ichirema and maybe his vice president Mutare Narumango, who was monitoring the hunger situation, should ask themselves is, where is a peasant farmer going to get 550 kwacha to buy a bag of maize? The answer is nowhere. So as we speak right now, Peter, people are starving. People are eating roots in these villages. They are eating roots. They are sleeping on roots, which they dig in the bush. When they wake up in the morning, 
they have to go in the bush to look for roots, dig roots, they come to their respective huts in the evening. Hakai Nechirema has reduced the people of this country to bushmen. We are living a hunter-gatherer kind of life in this day and age, in 2024. If you remember in past years, even during uh, Chiruba's time, when we had that drought in 1991, Chiruba went out there, he went to the U.S., he got uh, tons and tons of yellow maize, and he was distributing that yellow maize in the remote areas where people can't afford. And then in towns like Rusaka, he was selling it at a discounted price. You understand? Even during the PF regime, when we had that big drought in 2017, which was mostly uh, in southern and parts of eastern province, the PF administration went under uh, uh, this uh, DMMU coordinator, uh, uh, Kawe. They went and distributed the relief food, and that food was clearly labeled not for sale, relief food distributed when i say distributed i don't mean they packed a truck of zns and started selling no they went and gave door to door relief food for people to be able to eat uh, because they are not able to have any other source of food they haven't been able to cultivate anything from their respective fields that is what is missing under this administration there is no that heart for the people there is no that heart for the people. Hagai Nechirema wants to treat Zambia and the Zambian people like he's running a corporate entity, like it's a company. You understand? Where everything is for sale. You cannot sell everything. So, my challenge to government is those community sales of uh, maize by FRI, that's well and good. Do that in urban areas or do that in peri urban areas where the people who live there are teachers and maybe police officers and so on and so on but for the low rural low, low, low areas you can't sell maize there because people don't have money go there and give free food to the people want to achieve the next farming season so that they can still be alive by the time the rains come that is what the upnd administration should do that is what haka Chilema should do Mr. Tembo, yeah. we have four minutes left. Let's uh, squeeze in a few calls so that you people get to interact with you. It's 0974 870 877 We'd like to hear from you this morning. We have Pep President uh, Mr. Sean Tembo joining us on the hot seat this morning. If you have a question or contribution, do call us now. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning, please. How are you? Fine. How are you doing? What's your name? Um, I'm doing okay. My name is Janda. Good morning, Mr. Sean Tembo. Uh, good morning, sir. And Mr. Tembo, I would like you first of all to clarify. It's funny that you are calling the judiciary as a UPAT contender, and yet you are the same person who continues to take your complex to the same court. Where is the logic on your part? Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Chanda. Zero nine seven four eight seven zero eight seven seven zero nine five zero nine five five eight seven seven. We'd like to hear from you this morning. Uh, zero nine seven four eight seven zero eight seven seven or zero nine five zero nine five five eight seven seven. We'll get you through to the hot seat this morning if you have a question for Mr. Temple. Good morning. Good morning, TV. Morning to you. Good morning, Mr. Sean Temple. Good morning, Madam. How are you? I'm okay. Um, Mr. Sean Tembo, very valid point you're giving out. What's your name? Natasha. All right, Natasha, please go ahead with your question or contribution. Uh, I just wanted to say Mr. Sean Tembo is giving out some um, very valid points, and it would be good if you join the UCA party. All right, Natasha, thank you very much. Zero nine seven four eight seven zero eight seven seven zero nine five zero nine five five eight seven seven. Those lines will get you through to the hot seat. We'd like to hear what you have to say uh, regarding uh, what we've just talked about with Mr. Temple. Good morning. Ah, order, order. Uh, Francis Mumbenzika is calling you from Lusaka town. Good morning, Temple. How are you this morning? Uh, good morning, sir. Yes, and good morning to our presenter there. Thank you. Good morning, Wamuni. Quickly, please, quickly. please go ahead with your question. Thank, thank you, yes. Yes, quickly, quickly. Uh, uh, Sean Tembo, if you become president of Zambia and if you have to advise the government, how would you advise them to handle the issue of fuel procurement? This month it is used and so on. And then what measures would you put in place to ensure that we receive cheaper fuel that the Zambians can be able to benefit in the way they do things? Then lastly, the issue of Mopani. 
the issue of Mopani was the procedure followed the way it is because we are hearing no, there was no need for it to go through parliament. So that issue, is it impeachable? What is it that Zanans can do? What is it that leaders can do to ensure that correct things are done within the country? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mumbi. Uh, Mr. Tambo, please tackle those three. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, the first gentleman said uh, we are referring to the judiciary as a European Dikatemba. So why should we keep taking cases there? So the reason is simple, um, uh, Peter. Um, if we say that uh, the DPP, the Gilbert Piri, is a UPND cadre, people will not understand. They will think maybe we are jealous of uh, Mr. Piri. Um, but when we demonstrate through taking cases to court, such as the one for Emenda where he called uh, the Archbishop of Lusaka as the Lucifer of Zambia, and uh, Gilbert Piri refuses to grant consent, and then on the other hand, Gilbert Piri is busy jailing individuals, uh, ensuring individuals are sentenced to lengthy sentences, mm -hmm. appealing Chishimba Kambwiri's uh, five-month sentence, he wants two years. People are able to see through demonstration, not through Sean Tembo talking on Hot FM, but through demonstration. So that is the reason we take these cases to court. Uh, for the cases we take to the constitutional court, remember that the Concord is the final court. And um, when we say that uh, this court has been watered down uh, through the appointment of Hagaende uh, Hichirma's uh, surrogates on the bench, and that uh, the quality and standard of their judgments is below par. People will think that Sean Tembo is uh, just politicking. But when we take cases there, uh, we are going to be able, we have been able to demonstrate to the people, mm -hmm. for them to see for themselves, to say, the quality of these judgments are tilted one side. A case in point is uh, that case we took to the Concord where we wanted to compel um, President Hagaide Ichirema to move to State House on the basis that um, uh, his continued stay at his private residence was a huge drain on the resources of the nation because uh, you need to keep uh, making those trips and uh, police officers route training and so on and so forth. Mm. We made very clear arguments in our petition. And uh, when you look at the petition, the questions we raised in the petition, and you look at the judgment that came from the Constitutional Court, the judgment was answering questions which we never asked. And the questions we raised in our petition were never addressed in the judgment. And that judgment, anyone uh, who understand, uh, who has a basic understanding of the law or has a fair share of common sense will be able to see for themselves. So when we sit on a radio program like here and we say the judiciary is compromised, people are going to get our message with a pinch of salt. But when we demonstrate by taking cases to court that we have a rotten judiciary, we have a compromised judiciary. Uh, at major street level, we have a judiciary whose sole intention is to send the political rivals of Haka and HLMA to prison. And at Concord level, we have a quality of judiciary uh, whose sole objective is to protect the illegalities of Haka and HLMA. No matter how much Haka and HLMA breaches the Constitution, the Constitutional Court will always be on hand to protect his illegalities. And people are able to see for themselves. So that is the uh, uh, reason we take these cases uh, to court. Uh, uh, speaking about uh, Natasha, uh, who said uh, uh, we've raised uh, valid points, we should join UCA. We have said it before and we'll say it again. For us, we have a very high appetite to join not only UCA, but any other progressive opposition alliance. We have a high appetite to join UCA, we have a high appetite to join the People's Pact, we have a high appetite to join the Omozi alliance, uh, we have a high appetite to put hands together with other political parties to ensure that we deliver a better government for the people of this country. Uh, what we just want to ensure is that even as we come together with whoever else we're going to come together with, they are people whose mindsets, whose attitudes are going to add to our prospects and are going to add to our potential performance in 2026 and not divide from it. And um, yeah, basically that is where we stand. We look forward to joining one of the alliances, whether UCA or indeed any other alliance. Uh, coming to the last question from uh, Mr. Francis Mumbi about fuel prices. 
You know, when you talk about stability of fuel prices, first of all, I want to emphasize, Peter, that um, for you to learn a sustainable economy, you need to ensure there is stability in key production inputs. And when you talk about key production inputs, you're talking about electricity. Uh, and when I talk about stability, I'm talking about stability of supply as well as stability of prices. So you're talking about electricity and you're talking about fuel. Fuel, again, you're talking about stability of pricing as well as stability of uh, uh, price, uh, uh, supply. Um, without stability in these key production inputs, it will remain a pipe dream for you to grow a sustainable, strong economy. You understand? So, the issue of fuel, you know, the MMD and uh, Levi Mwanawasa came up with, um, um, they called it uh, the Fuel Stabilization Fund and uh, uh, the Energy Regulation Board. The way this fund operated is that uh, when prices of fuel were very, very low, um, they used to charge an average price and they would get whatever additional funds they have into this fund. When prices are high, they would do get funds from this fund and uh, uh, basically subsidize the prices of fuel. Uh, by so doing, they ensured sustainability in terms of pricing. We haven't seen that. One question which the Zambian people should ask is, during COVID, uh, fuel was oil was selling at negative prices on the world market, which means uh, government was able to get uh, fuel at ridiculously low prices, maybe just adding transportation and so on and so forth, which means they made a huge saving, uh, but the pump price remained the same. So there was a lot of profit that was made through the importation of oil. Where is that money? Because that money should have been put in that fund. So that when prices are high, maybe because uh, there's instability in the Middle East, uh, Israel is fighting Hamas, or Iran is, uh, uh, has crossed uh, the, the, the Red Sea, then you use that money from the fund to subsidize the pricing of fuel. That is why the approach adopted by the UPND administration and the arguments advanced by Haka Inde Ichilema to say you cannot subsidize uh, fuel uh, is an argument that does not carry water. Because you cannot allow the local economy to be subjected to those fluctuations in world fuel prices. When you allow the domestic economy to be subjected to those external fluctuations, it means there will not be stability in the local economy. And there is no economy which can grow if it is not stable. The starting point to growing an economy is to ensure stability. Once you have stability, then the economy is able to grow. Mr. Tembo, I'd like to thank you very much for coming through to the hot seat today. Thank you for having me, Peter. It was a pleasure. All right, that's all for you today, lovely viewers. If you did enjoy the video, please don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section below. Tell me what you think about the video you just watched in the comment section below. I'll be super glad to hear from you, lovely viewers. Once again, I go by the name of Mutatim Pondum. I love you. Peace. I gotta go.